Warmest greetings to all my incredible subscribers and new viewers alike. Hello, fellow enthusiasts. Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of IRT Flushing Line. The IRT Flushing Line is a rapid transit route of the New York City subway system named for its eastern terminal in Flushing, Queens. It is operated as part of their division. The Interbro Rapid Transit Company IRT, a private operator, had constructed the section of the line from Flushing, Queens, to Times Square, Manhattan between 1915 and 1928. A western extension was opened to Hudson Yards in western Manhattan in 2015, and the line now stretches from Flushing to Chelsea, Manhattan. It carries trains of the local service, as well as the express during rush hours in the peak direction. It is the only currently operational IRT line to serve Queens. It is shown in the color on station signs, the official subway map, and internal route maps in cars. Before the line was opened all the way to Flushing in 1928, it was known as the Corona Line or Woodside and Corona Line. Prior to the discontinuation of BMT services in 1949, the portion of the IRT Flushing Line between Times Square and Queensboro Plaza was known as the Queensboro Line. Since the mid ers the line's signal system has been converted to an automated system. The Flushing Line has various styles of architecture, which range from steel girder elevated structures to European-style concrete viaducts. The underground stations have some unique designs as well. The designs include Hunters Point Avenue, which is in an Italianate style, Grand Central Street, which is a single round tube similar to a London underground station, and 34th Street Hudson Yards, which, with its deep vault and spacious interior, resembles a Washington metro station. Get ready for an exciting exploration as we unravel the mysteries of route. Services that use the Flushing Line are coloured. The following services use part or all of the IRT Flushing Line. The line has two distinct sections, split by the Queensboro Plaza Station. It begins as a three-track subway, with the centre track used for express service, at Flushing Main Street. It quickly leads the ground onto a steel elevated structure above Roosevelt Avenue passing City Field and the United States Tennis Association's National Tennis Center. A flying junction between Metzwillitz Point and 111th Street provides access to the Corona Yard from the local tracks. At 48th Street in Sunnyside, the line switches to Queens Boulevard and an ornate concrete viaduct begins. The express track ends between 33rd Street to Rosen Street and Queensboro Plaza. At Queensboro Plaza, the eastbound track railroad north is above the westbound track, with both tracks on the south side of the island platforms. On the north side of these platforms is the BMT Astoria Line. East of this point, both the Flushing Line and the Astoria Line were formerly operated by the IRT and the BMT. Connections still exist between the eastbound tracks just east of the platforms, but cannot be used for revenue service as BMT trains are wider than IRT trains. This is the only track connection between the Flushing Line and the rest of the subway system. West of Queensboro Plaza, the line sharply turns south onto an elevated structure over 23rd Street. It heads into the west end of Amtrak's Sunnyside Yard and passes through two underground stations before entering Manhattan via the Steinway Tunnel under the East River. In Manhattan, the line runs under 42nd Street, with part directly underneath the 42nd Street shuttle, before angling towards 41st Street. The Times Square and Street Station, with no track connections to other lines, is directly under 41st Street. West of Times Square, the tracks curve sharply downward before turning under 11th Avenue. The tracks end at 24th Street, even though the last station is at 34th Street. This segment was built as part of the extension of the Flushing Line west to Manhattan's far west side C. A decommissioned lower level at the IND 8th Avenue Line's 42nd Street Port Authority Bus Terminal Station formerly blocked the way. 
Although London ultimately received the bid for the 2012 Summer Olympics, New York City pursued the extension anyway, albeit as a means to enable the redevelopment of the far west side under the Hudson Yards Redevelopment Project. In this section, we'll be exploring distinctions. The Flushing Line is one of only two New York City non-shuttle subway lines that hosts only a single service and does not share operating trackage with any other line or service. The other is the BMT Canarsi Line, carrying the train. Because of this, the MTA is automating the line with new trains using communication-based train control CBTC, similar to the Canarsi Line C. The IRT Flushing Lines 7 service has the distinction of running trains with the largest number of cars in the New York City subway. Seven trains are 11 cars long. Most other New York City subway services run 10 or 8 car trains. The trains are not the longest by total length, however. An induct train of 10 60 foot long cars or 8 75 foot long cars, which is 600 foot long, is still combat longer than an IRT train of 11 51.4 foot long cars, which is 565 foot long. Let's now zoom in on origins and uncover the hidden gems that lie within. The earliest origins of the Flushing Line emerged on February 22. 1885, with the founding of the East River Tunnel Railroad. The railroad would construct the Steinway Tunnel under the East River, connecting the Long Island Railroad in Queens with the New York Central Railroad in Manhattan. However, the East River Tunnel Railroad Company went defunct. On July 22, 1887, Walter South, Kenny and Malcolm W. Niven founded the New York and Long Island Railroad Company Nyaya. They soon began planning for the tunnel. To run from West 42nd Street and 10th Avenue to Van Alst Avenue after crossing under the East River, the builders planned for the remainder of the line to be constructed on private lands, and numerous alterations were made to the proposal. In 1890, William Steinway advised the company to utilize electricity to power the tunnels, believing that the construction of the tunnel would increase the value of his properties in the vicinity. On June 3, 1892, construction of the tunnel commenced near the intersection of 50th Avenue and Vernon and Jackson Avenues. However, several failures and hindrances, which included an underground spring preventing the extraction of rubble, resulted in the termination of the project on February 2, 1893. Several calls for the resumption of the project between 1893 and 1896, in addition to a proposed extension to New Jersey, were futile. The tunnel opened for subway use on June 22, 1915, with service running between Grand Central and Vernon Jackson Avenues. The Flushing Line was extended one stop from Vernon Jackson Avenues to Hunters Point Avenue on February 15, 1916. On November 5, 1916, the Flushing Line was extended two more stops to the east to the Queensborough Plaza Station. At this point, the Flushing Line between Grand Central and Queensborough Plaza was called the Queensborough Line. In this part of the video, we'll be delving deeper into construction under the dual contracts and analyzing its key components. The dual contracts were formalized in March 1913, specifying new lines or expansions to be built by the IRT and the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company BRT. The dual contracts involved opening the Steinway Tunnel as part of the new Flushing subway line. The route, traveling under 41st and 42nd Streets in Manhattan, was to go from Times Square through the tunnel over to Long Island City and from there continue toward Flushing. At Queensborough Plaza, the line met the 60th Street Tunnel, as well as a spur from the elevated IRT 2nd Avenue line on the Queensborough Bridge. From this point east, the Flushing and Astoria lines were built by the City of New York as part of the dual contracts. They were officially IRT lines on which the BMT held irrevocable and equal trackage rights. Because BMT trains were wider, and the platforms had been built for the IRT, normal BMT trains ran only to Queensborough Plaza, with a transfer to shuttles, using elevated cars 
that alternated between the Astoria Dittler's Boulevard and Flushing Main Street terminals. IRT trains simply continued from the Queensboro Line and Queensboro Bridge onto the lines to Astoria and Flushing. The line to Flushing was originally called the Corona Line or Woodside and Corona Line before it was completed to Flushing. The line was opened from Queensboro Plaza to Albertus Avenue on April 21, 1917. The Flushing Line was initially derided by opponents, as it passed through agricultural areas rather than connecting populated places, as previous lines had. Rapid development quickly followed once the Flushing Line was operational, with six-story apartment buildings being erected directly on the former fields and several major firms building housing for their workers along the route. By June 1917 ridership on the line was exceeding expectations, with 363,726 passengers using the Corona line that month, 126,100 using the Queensboro Plaza station, and 363,508 using the Queensboro subway. The empty shuttles began to use the Flushing and Astoria lines on April 8, 1923. Service to 111th Street was inaugurated on October 13, 1925, with shuttle service running between 111th Street and the previous terminal at Albertus Avenue, now 103rd Street Corona Plaza on the Manhattan-bound track. The line to Main Street had been practically completed at this point, but had to be rebuilt in part due to the sinking of the foundations of the structure in the vicinity of Flushing Creek. Once the structure was deemed to be safe for operation, the line was extended to Woollett Point Boulevard on May 7, 1927. This extension was served by shuttle trains until through service was inaugurated on May 14. On that date, the opening of the station was formally celebrated. It coincided with the opening of the Roosevelt Avenue Bridge for cars and buses. Wooden elevated rolling stock had to be used by the BMT, as the Flushing Line was built to IRT clearances, and standard steel BMT subway rolling stock were not compatible. Get ready for an exciting exploration as we unravel the mysteries of Western expansion. In July 1920, the New York State Public Service Commission announced it would extend the flushing line to stops west to Times Square, with an intermediate station under Bryant Park. The western end of the Bryant Park station would be 300th east of 6th Avenue, while the eastern end would be about under the original line. Long, though only a convert section would be used, initial 5th Avenue station opened on March 22. 1926, extending the IRT Flushing Line 1 stop to the west from the line's previous terminus at Grand Central. In fall 1926, it was announced that the line would be completed by January 1, 1927. On February 8, 1927, the New York City Board of Transportation informed the New York State Transit Commission that work on the Times Square station was sufficiently completed to enable the start of train service beginning on February 19, 1927 with the completion of work to a point between 8th Avenue and 7th Avenue. Plans for the construction of an extension of the line to between 8th Avenue and 9th Avenue to provide a physical connection with the IND 8th Avenue line were underway. On March 1, 1927, the opening of the line was set for March 15, the third time an opening date was set for the line. Work had been postponed given the amount of work that remained to be completed. The opening of the line was about a year behind the April 29, 1926 date specified in the contract. The delay was the result of surprisingly difficult construction. The Board of Transportation had withheld retained percentages, as allowed in the contract, penalising the contractor, and trying to incentivize it to speed up work. No retained percentages were provided to the contractor until February 1927. The flushing line was extended to Times Square on March 14, 1927. Brace yourself for an enlightening exploration of Eastern expansion as we dive into its profound implications. 
the eastern extension to Flushing Main Street opened on January 21, 1928. At this time, Corona Yard opened, with the inspection shed and some yard tracks available for use. The remaining tracks opened on April 16, 1928. For the 1939 New York World's Fair, the Willits Point Boulevard station was rebuilt and centered on 123rd Street, just west of where the station originally lay. Some remnants of the old station are still visible. Iron work tends to indicate where the older outside platform stations were, and the remains of the fair entry area can be seen east of the current station. The original Willits Point Boulevard station was a minor stop on the Flushing Line. It had only two stairways and short station canopies at platform level. It was rebuilt into the much larger station in use today, and the ramp used during two world's fairs still exists, but is only used during special events such as the US Open for tennis. Express service to the world's fair began on the Flushing Line on April 24, 1939. Currently and historically, the IRT assigned the number 7 to its Flushing Line subway service, though this did not appear on any equipment until the introduction of the rolling stock in 1948. The BMT assigned the number 9 to its service, used on maps but not signed on trains. Let's now shift gears and explore unrealized eastern expansion through a critical lens, uncovering its strengths and weaknesses. The main street station was not intended to be the Flushing Line's terminus. While the controversy over an elevated line in Flushing was ongoing in January 1913, the Whitestone Improvement Association pushed for an elevated to Whitestone, College Point, and Bayside. However, some members of that group wanted to oppose the Flushing Line's construction if there was not going to be an extension to Whitestone. In January 1913, Groups representing communities in South Flushing collaborated to push for an elevated along what was then the Liars Central Branch, in the current right-of-way of Kissinger Corridor Park. Shortly after, the New York Public Service Commission PSC announced its intent to extend the line as an L from Corona to Flushing, with a possible further extension to Little Neck Bay in Bayside. There was consensus that the line should not abruptly end in Corona, but even with the extension to Bayside, the borough would still have fewer dual contracts route mileage than either Brooklyn or the Bronx. The New York Times wrote that compared to the Bronx, Queens would have far less subway mileage per capita even with the Flushing extension. The Bayside extension was tentatively approved in June 1913, but only after the construction of the initial extension to Flushing. Under the revised subway expansion plan put forth in December 1913, the Flushing Line would be extended past Main Street, along and a parallel to the right-of-way of the nearby Port Washington branch of the LIRR towards Bell Boulevard in Bayside. A spur line would branch off north along 149th Street towards College Point. In 1914, the PSC chairman and the commissioner committed to building the line toward Bayside. However, at the time, the LIR and IRT were administered separately, and the IRT plan would require rebuilding a section of the Port Washington branch between the Broadway and Obendal stations. The LIR moved to block the IRT extension past Flushing since it would compete with the Port Washington branch service in Bayside. One member of the United Civic Association submitted a proposal to the LIRR to let the IRT use the Port Washington branch to serve Flushing and Bayside, using a connection between the two lines in Corona. The PSC supported the connection as an interim measure, and on March 11, 1915, it voted to let the Bayside connection be built. Subsequently, Engineers surveying the planned intersection of the LIR and IRT lines found that the IRT land would not actually overlap with any LIR land. The LIRR president at the time, Rolf Peters, offered to lease the Port Washington and Whitestone branches to the IRT for rapid transit use for $250,000 annually, excluding other maintenance costs. The lease would last for 10 years, with an option to extend the lease by 10 more years. The PSC favoured the idea of the IRT being a lessee along these lines, but did not know where to put the Corona connection. 
even the majority of groups in Eastern Queens supported the lease plan. The only group who opposed the lease agreement was the Flushing Association, who preferred a previous plan to build the Corona Line extension as a subway under Amity Street currently Roosevelt Avenue, ending at Main Street. Afterward, the PSC largely ignored the lease plan since it was still focused on building the first phase of the dual contracts. The Flushing Businessmen's Association kept advocating for the Amity Street subway, causing a schism between them and the rest of the groups that supported the LIRR lease. Through the summer of 1915, the PSC and the LIRR negotiated the planned lease to $125,000 a first year, with an 8% increase each year. The negotiations then stalled in 1916. The Whitestone Improvement Association, impatient with the pace of negotiations, approved of the subway under Amity Street even though it would not serve them directly. The TSC chief engineer wrote in a report that a combined 20,600 riders would use the Whitestone and Bayside lines each day in either direction, and that by 1927 there would be 34,000 riders per day per direction. The Third Ward Rapid Transit Association wrote a report showing how much they had petitioned for flushing subway extensions to that point, compared to how little progress they had made in doing so. Negotiations continued to be stalled in 1917. Despite the line not having been extended past Corona yet, the idea of a subway extension to Little Nick encouraged development there. The Whitestone branch would have had to be rebuilt if it were leased to the subway with railroad crossings removed and the single track doubled. The PSC located 14 places where crossings needed to be eliminated. However, by early 1917, there was barely enough money to build the subway to Flushing, let alone a link to Whitestone and Bayside. A lease agreement was announced on October 16, 1917 but the IRT withdrew from the agreement a month later, citing that it was inappropriate to enter such an agreement at that time. Thereafter, the PSC instead turned its attention back to the Main Street subway extension. Even after the Main Street station opened in 1928, efforts to extend the line past Flushing persisted. In 1928, the New York City Board of Transportation VOT proposed allowing IRT trains to build a connection to use the Whitestone branch, but the IRT did not accept the offer since this would entail upgrading railroad crossings and the single-tracked line. Subsequently, the LIRR abandoned the branch in 1932. As part of the 1929 IND Second System Plan, the Flushing Line would have had branches to College Point and Bayside east of Main Street. That plan was revived in 1939. The BOT kept proposing an extension of the Flushing Line past Main Street until 1945, when World War I, I ended and new budgets did not allow for a Flushing extension. Since then, several New York City Transit Authority proposals for an eastward extension have all failed. As we move forward, let's uncover the untold stories and fascinating intricacies of service curtailments and slight improvements. In the Earth's 2nd Avenue line service, including the connection across the Queensborough Bridge, ended June 13, 1942 and free transfers to the IRT 3rd Avenue line were offered at Grand Central. These transfers were valid until May 12, 1955, when 3rd Avenue line service ended. On October 17, 1949, the joint Turt service arrangement ended. The Flushing line became the responsibility of IRT. The Astoria line had its platforms shaved back and became BMT only. Because of this, routes through the then eight-track Queensboro Plaza station were consolidated and the northern half of the structure was later torn down. Evidence of where the torn down platforms were, as well as the trackways that approached this area, can still be seen in the Iron work at the station. During the joint service period, the elevated stations on the Astoria and Flushing lines were only able to fit nine 51-foot-long BMT elevated or IRT cars the rough equivalent of seven 67-foot-long BMT subway cars. 
After the Turk dual services ended in 1949, the New York City Board of Transportation announced that the Flushing Line platforms would be lengthened to 11 IRT car lengths, and the Astoria Line platforms extended to 9 BMT car lengths. The project, to start in 1950, would cost $3.85 million. Identification of trains and routing automatically IDENTRA was implemented on the line in the 1957 and use until 1997, when a route selector punch box with Astoria local express buttons was installed at the car marker on the upper level of Queensboro Plaza. IDNTRA used a removable round circular disc type radio antenna assembly slide mounted on the small mounting brackets that were attached on the front of and cars that were assigned to the 7 route, which had been used on the line since 1948. Similar to the use of radio transponders in the CBTC installation, the system used the antennas to determine whether a train was running local or express, and then accordingly switched to the track at interlockings near the Queensboro Plaza and Flushing Main Street stations. This move reduced the number of signal towers on the line from 9 to 2 and theoretically allowed to operate 37 11 car trains instead of only 39 car trains per hour. The consolidated signal system was in use by 1956 while the selector system was in service by 1958. However, in practice, train frequencies were not necessarily increased. According to an experiment performed by the Long Island Star Journal in 1957, rush hour headways ranged from 6 to 15 minutes between local trains and 2 to 6 minutes between express trains. In 1953, with increased ridership on the line, a super express service was instituted on the line. The next year, the trains were lengthened to nine cars each. Subsequently, the trains were extended to ten cars on November 1, 1962. With the World's Fair in Flushing Meadows Grona Park in April 1964, trains were lengthened to eleven cars. The Flushing Line received 430 new rooms and cars for this enhanced service. Rolling stock along the Flushing Line received strip maps in 1965, the first such installation in the system. The strip maps showed only the stations on the Flushing Line, as opposed to for the entire system, but the transfers available at each station were listed. In the upcoming section, we'll be shining a light on decline and rehabilitation. As with much of the rest of the subway system, the IRT flushing line was allowed to deteriorate throughout the ERS to the late ERS. Structural defects that required immediate attention at the time were labelled as code red defects or red tag areas, and were numerous on the flushing line. Some columns that supported elevated structures on the flushing line were so shaky that trains did not run when the wind speed exceeded 65 miles per hour. This was particularly widespread on the Flushing and the BMT Jamaica lines. On May 13, 1985, a four-year-long project, $70 million project to overhaul the IRT Flushing line commenced. It forced single tracking on much of the line during weekends, and the elimination of express service for the duration of the project. The MTA advertised this change by putting leaflets in the New York Times, the Staten Island Advance, the Daily News, and Newsa. The projects laid new track, replaced or repaired concrete and steel structures, replaced wooden station canopies with aluminum, improved lighting, improved signage, and installed new ventilation and pumping equipment. Expanded service was provided when the Mets played home games or when there were sporting events in Flushing Meadows Rona Park. Paradoxically, Flushing local trains had better on-time performance during the construction than before it started. The $70 million rehabilitation project on the Queens Boulevard concrete viaduct was completed six months early, and seven express service was restored on August 21, 1989, without stopping at 61st Street Woodside. This led to protests by community members to get express service back at 61st Street Station. The reason for the discontinuance on the Flushing Express was because the MTA felt it took too long to transfer between locals and expresses. 
The service was also due to fears of delays on the line when locals and expresses merged after 33rd Street or Orson Street. The change was supposed to enable local trains to stop at 61st Street every 4 minutes 15 trains per hour during rush hours, but according to riders, the trains arrived every minutes. The community opposition led to service changes, and expresses began stopping at Woodside again a few months later. On weekends between January 19 and March 11, seven service was partially shut down so that switches at the Fisk interlocking could be replaced. The $5 million project was not done in conjunction with the work between 1985 and 1989 because the 23-year-old switches were not due for replacement. In the mid hours the MTA discovered that the Queen's Boulevard viaduct structure was unstable, as rocks that were used to support the tracks as ballast became loose due to poor drainage, which, in turn, affected the integrity of the concrete structure overall. Seven Express service was suspended again between 61st Street Woodside and Queen's Borough Plaza. Temporary platforms were installed to access the express track in the four intermediate stations. The work began on April 5, 1993. When the viaduct reconstruction finished on March 31, 1997, full 7 express service was reinstated. Throughout this entire period, ridership grew steadily. In spring 2018, express service west of 74th Street was suspended temporarily so the MTA could fix the supports under the center track at 61st Street. As we transition, let's shed light on automation of the line and its relevance to our ongoing exploration. In January 2012, the MTA selected Fools for a $343 million contract to set up a communications-based train control CBTC system as part of the plan to automate the line. This was the second installation of CBTC, following a successful implementation on the BMT Canarsi line. The total cost was $550 million for the signals and other trackside infrastructure, and $613.70 million for CBTC-compliant rolling stock. The safety assessment at system level was performed using the formal method Event B. The MTA chose the flushing line for the next implementation of CBTC because it is also a self-contained line with no direct connections to other subway lines currently in use. Funding was allocated in the capital budget for CBTC installation on the flushing line, with scheduled installation completion in 2016. The cars were ordered so the line would have compatible rolling stock. CBTC on the line will allow that to run 7% more service, or two more trains per hour during peak hours before retrofit. It ran 27th. However, the system had been retrofitted to operate at 33 TF even without CBTC. The first train of cars began operating in passenger service on November 9, 2013. Test runs of was in automated mode started in late 2014. However, the CBTC retrofit date was later pushed back to 2017 or 2018 after a series of problems that workers encountered during installation including problems with the RAS. The project also went over budget, costing $405 million for a plan originally marked at $265.60 million. The whole line was queued over to CBTC operation on November 26, 2018, with the completion of the segment from Hudson Yards to the north of Grand Central. Completely independent of the CBTC installation is the 7 subway extension C below, which features both CBTC signals and fixed block signaling. The extension will also increase line capacity. Now, let's shift our attention to extension westward. In the ERS, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority MTA began exploring the possibility of a flushing line extension to New Jersey. In 2001, a business and civic group convened by Senator Charles Schumer argued that a proposed westward extension of the Midtown Office District could not be accomplished without a subway extension, saying. An extension of the Flushing Line was then proposed as part of the New York City bid for the 2012 Summer Olympics. 
the city wanted to get funding before July 2005, at which time the International Olympic Committee would vote on funding, but due to budget shortfalls, the MTA could not pay to fund the extension. After New York City lost their Olympic bid, the government of New York City devised a rezoning plan for the Hudson Yards area and proposed two new subway stations to serve that area. The subway extension was approved following the successful rezoning of about 60 blocks from 28th to 43rd streets, which became the Hudson Yards neighborhood. In October 2007, the MTA awarded a $1.15 billion contract to build an extension from Times Square to Hudson Yards. There is one new station at 34th Street and 11th Avenue to serve Hudson Yards. The MTA originally planned for another station at 10th Avenue and 41st Street but eliminated it due to lack of funding. The extension's opening was delayed several times due to issues in installing the custom-made incline elevators for the 34th Street station. The extension eventually opened on September 13, 2015. The 34th Street Hudson Yards station's design has been compared to that of Washington Metro stations or to those of stations along London's Jubilee Line extension. Moving on to the next segment, we have station renovations. In early 2012, the 45th Rodekert House Square station was closed for a complete renovation, which included the addition of elevators and a connection to the Court Scorerd Street station complex. Additionally, several stations along the line, including Vernon Bowliver Jackson Avenue, Queensborough Plaza, 33rd Street, and 46th Street, are slated to receive elevators as part of the MTA Capital Program. As part of the Capital Program, the MTA would renovate the 52nd, 61st, 69th, 82nd, 103rd and 111th Street stations, a project that has been delayed for several years. Conditions at these stations were among the worst of all stations in the subway system. Work was supposed to begin in mid-2020 but was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City. The MTA hired Judler Contracting as the contractor for the project. In March 2023, Judler leased space near the 82nd Street station for a construction office. The MTA planned to begin renovating the 61st, 82nd, and 111th Street stations in 2023, the 52nd and 69th Street stations in 2024 and the 103rd Street Station in 2025. Leave a comment below and let me know what you thought of this video.